Well, I'll tell you, we are truly honored uh, this week to have Jonathan Shuttlesworth with us. You know, the more and more you see the move of God within the world, you realize that this world needs a supernatural God. They need a God that can, in, that can come and intervene into very desperate situations. And I'm so thankful that there are those evangelists and pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets that are there pressing into the supernatural touch of God upon their ministries. And this week is going to be an incredible time. I'm so excited, and we are honored to have Jonathan Shuttlesworth with us this morning. Would you stand and give him a welcome to Jacksonville and to our church? Now give Jesus a great hand clap all through the auditorium. I assure you, he's the only one worth clapping for. Just bow your heads and close your eyes as you're seated. Father, I thank you that right from the outset of these meetings, that whole families will be changed by your power, beginning right from today. Thank you there won't be one wasted moment that your spirit is going to solve every unsolvable problem this day. We're in your house. We've come to meet with you, and we thank you in advance because we know you're not in the habit of disappointing anyone. But everywhere people come with expectation, you meet their expectation. So we give you the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said amen. amen. Give the Lord God another hand clap all through the building again. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Nice to be with you in Jacksonville, Florida. This is my first time ever in Jacksonville. I never. Ne thank you very much. And uh, it's very different being in the south from the north. I was preaching outside of Boston uh, last week, and when they said greet, take, take, a, uh, take some time and greet a few people, I think it lasted about six seconds. In Boston, you just look at the person on each side of you and grunt and then go back to what you were doing. <laughs> and then when you go south and the churches say, take a few minutes to greet people, you wonder if they're going to get done in time for the night service. <laughs> so it's nice to be with friendly people. And uh, I got my wife and daughter with me, and we're happy to be here. And uh, your pastor and his wife were so great. I met your pastor for about two and a half minutes in, in uh, January of this year. And he said, I'd like to have you into our church. And I, do you have any cards? Well, I don't carry cards with me when I go to minister's things because then you just look like a, like a weasel. You know, you're just like waiting around to give your cards out. So when he said that, I said, no, I don't have any cards. And I like quickly told him where he could contact me. And I thought I wouldn't, wouldn't hear from him again. Then the next thing I knew, it was all set up, the TV spots taken out. So I guess your pastor doesn't mess around. Well, most people take them to do like two years, like they're plotting the invasion of Normandy. But I know we're going to have a great week together, and I'm going to play a video in just a, a couple of minutes. I'll introduce it for you. Our ministry took a dramatic turn last year. Um, of course, when I was eight years old, I was minding my own business. My mother sent me up to change for bed on the second floor of our house outside of Pittsburgh. And uh, I bent over to pick up my pajamas. When I looked up, there was an angel on the other side of the bed. And so I never used to tell this story because, you know, most people, if they talk about seeing angels, you look in their eyes, they look like they see lots of things. <laughs> so seriously, I never really told anybody. I told my parents when I was a kid, I never used to even bring it up preaching because um, I would think people would think you're crazy. But then I realized after reading what people posted about me on the internet that if you preach about God and healing, people think you're crazy anyway, so you might as well tell the story. <laughs> so I, I bent over and picked my pajamas up and looked up. There was an angel on the other side of the bed. And the angel said, Jonathan, God has reserved you for this last period of time to be an evangelist, to call men and women that are now in darkness into the light, for soon it will be eternally too late. Do you understand? I said, yes. I had a speech impediment, eight sounds in the alphabet that I couldn't say correctly, and I had been in speech therapy from, what, first grade. I missed recess two days a week to get it corrected. So actually, when the angel called me to preach, uh, it wasn't even physically possible to do it. You can't speak publicly when you can't speak privately correctly. So uh, I, I said yes, and the angel disappeared. The whole thing took about 45 seconds. I had a guy ask me, why don't you write a book on that? Very hard to find a publisher that will carry a book that's three quarters of a page long when the foreword's longer than the actual book. So anyway, when that angel left, it was like I got my marching orders. And the speech impediment cleared up after about one year. I had braces on my legs. My legs were crooked. I actually had an old lady come up to the altar after I finished preaching near where I grew up. And she said, Jonathan, you probably don't remember me. I was your preschool teacher. 
Where are the braces that are on your legs? I said, back in hell with my speech impediment. Amen. <laughs> Return to sender. So, when it comes to preaching on God and him being a miracle working God, it's very easy for me because I couldn't do anything I'm doing if it wasn't for the hand of God. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, they that know their God shall become strong and do exploits. So it's not possible to have a relationship with God and his strength not get infused in you. So I launched out, you know, I was only eight. I finished school, uh, went to Bible school, finished there. I had about two places to preach when I graduated. And uh, that was 14 years ago coming up May 10th. And then I finished those two places, wondered how in the world I was, who was ever going to want to have, you know, it's not like people are begging to have 21-year-olds come and preach at their churches. After that second meeting, there were three kids that got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Uh, and it turned out their grandfather was a pastor in Vermont. So he had me in and then it just snowballed from there. But last year in the month of April, I was preaching outside of Philadelphia and I had gone to get a cheesesteak one of the nights and just was absolutely awestruck at what a mess Philadelphia was. There were Muslims walking around everywhere. You know, it's in America. And then I preach overseas. Islam's not good, regardless of what they tell you on CNN and uh, all the other stations. I promise you, Islam and Christianity never coexist in any nation. Islam is not backed by the same God we're backed by. It's backed by a God named Allah, who is actually a demon that loves violence. If you study it from the beginning, it's a problem. And so when you see it moving into the nation, we love Muslims, but Islam is a problem. And so I saw all the Muslims walking around. I thought, this is ridiculous. And then I, I was preaching that night, and it came up out of my spirit. I said, Philadelphia is a mess, which I didn't plan to say. If you're preaching in Philadelphia, you don't score a lot of points. But, you know, imagine they hand me the mic. Hey, thanks for having me to Jacksonville. Your city's a mess. You know, people are like, I never wanted to hear this guy anyway. Can we please have our pastor back? So I said, Philadelphia is a mess. I said, somebody needs to do something about it. And when I said somebody, I felt the Lord convict me because God never speaks to you to have somebody do something about something. He says he looks for somebody that will do something. And then if you'll, if you'll respond to God's call, that's where he'll empower you to do it. So when I felt convicted, I said, I'll do something about it. And I was scheduled like here, Sunday through Wednesday. So I said, I don't have anywhere to be till Sunday. I'm going to set up my speakers. I, I said, I have a sound system. I'll set up my sound system in downtown Philadelphia and just preach till somebody arrests me. And then, I, I, you know, everybody's just looking at me like, well, what's his problem? But I was serious. I went back to the hotel that night. I told my wife and daughter to go up to bed, and I'll meet up with you later. And I took two laps around the hotel and had a conversation with God. I said, Father, first of all, just to jog your memory, I wasn't begging you to send an angel. You sent one. And you told me to call people out of darkness into light for soon it'll be too late. And I just did the math with God because God's a numbers person. When I grew up, they said, God, how many of you know numbers aren't important to God? Well, then it's very interesting that he named an entire book of the Bible numbers. <laughs> so God, God's into numbers. I said, Father, think of this with me. Even if I spoke in big churches every week and we had 100 people a night come to the altar on average, which would be a lot, and 50 of them were new people. I said, uh, that would be, if you do the math, 15,000 new people saved a year, which you could put on Instagram and Twitter and everybody would think is great. But in a country of 300 million plus 30 million undocumented, which they count to, you can't change a nation 15,000 people at a time. I said, so we would have nice meetings and I would die and America would be worse. I said, however, if you'd give me a platform to, to speak to the city, and call people thousands at a time to Christ. Then, you know, and I reminded him of his scriptures. 2 Peter 3, 9, you're willing that none should perish, so you're giving more time so people uh, can repent and be saved. Let me do it. I said, I can't promote myself, but promotion comes from the Lord. So I ask you to open a door for me, over to you, and then I went to bed. So the next day, I had a noon service. The pastor of that church, 79 years old, he's 80 now, Brother Farina, he uh, started preaching when he was 17 in Brooklyn. So after 60 years of preaching, plus being from Brooklyn, he sounds like an extra on The Godfather. So when I, when I went to do the noon service after praying the night before, he was running. You know, you don't see 79-year-olds run that much. He was running towards me, and he said, Brother Jonathan, you're never going to believe what happened. I said, what? He said, when you said last night that you're going to set up your sound system and just preach until somebody arrests you, 
There was a lady that was connected to the city council of Philadelphia that was watching on the live stream. She went to city council today and said, there's a Pentecostal evangelist in our city. And he said he's going to set up his sound equipment downtown and preach till somebody arrests him. I thought maybe we could give him a permit so we don't have to arrest him. And they want to meet with you, and they want to give you use of any of the parks in the city of Philadelphia for outdoor meetings. They said you're an answer to prayer. Can you say amen? We serve a prayer answering God, you know. Just on a little side story. Everybody say we serve a prayer answering God. I was in uh, Manhattan, and I was out late. I took a taxi, and my, my driver was a Muslim. And so I had been studying Islam, and I figured if this guy's a, a Muslim, his name was Muhammad, long Arabic last name, so you, you, you knew he was a Muslim. So I asked him what country he was from. He was from Pakistan. I never told him I was a preacher or a Christian because I, wanted, I, wanted, I just wanted to find out about Islam, so I didn't want him to think I was debating with him. So I said, do you still pray five times every day? He said, oh, yeah. I said, well, how do you do that, driving taxi at night? He told me, I won't take a fare. After 4.30 a.m., I pull up to the mosque at 5 and pray. So I wasn't saying this to be, like, argumentative. I'd given him the benefit of the doubt. I didn't say, has your God ever answered you? I said, what's the greatest miracle? You know, praying five times a day, that's 150 prayers a month. So even if you're a lousy at praying, just from the sheer volume of it bats, you should get a, a single or a double every once in a while. So I, I said, uh, I said, what's the greatest miracle you've ever seen Allah do the whole time you, you've been a, a Muslim? He spun right around and went, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, what, what does that have to do with anything? He said, no, I know you're a Christian because of how you talk. He said, we are trained not to pray for, for him to do something for us. We just do it to, because we're supposed to. I thought, well, that's really no different than how most Christians pray. Just say your prayers before you go to bed. Say your prayers because you're supposed to. But God is a prayer answering God. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, we have this confidence that if we ask anything in his will and he hears us, he will answer us. So your God answers prayer. That Bible, Genesis to Revelation, is story after story of women that couldn't have babies, men that were born blind, kids that were deaf and mute, that, that, that suffered from seizures, that one call on the name of Jesus lifted the whole burden. And the Bible says God hasn't changed. So what he did back then is a record to put faith in you that you can call on that God today and he'll do the same thing for you. Can you say amen? Don't you think it's wonderful to serve a living God? Praise the Lord. Anyway, I won't go into the whole story. We had to jump really break through some hurdles because people that were higher up in the city, when they found out we weren't just going to, you know, have like a nice community gathering and we're actually going to preach and call people to get saved, they started giving us a problem. So we threatened to sue them for religious discrimination because you're, you're not allowed to tell somebody they can't use the park uh, because they're a Christian. And uh, so then the guy said, well, that's fine. They were going to charge us $7,500 to use the park. They said the new price is 40000 plus an $8,000 cleaning fee, even though we had 300 volunteers that clean the park every night. Well, that's not a problem because God's not broke. When God sneezes, more than 48,000 comes out of each nostril. Amen. He said, I'm El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. So actually, when they raised the price, I didn't have the money. And my crusade director said, uh, what do you want me to tell him? I said, ask him if he'd like cash, check, or gold bullion. Figured I'd put it off on God. And it was in 10 days. We had a man from Tulsa, Oklahoma, who never contacted anybody, never put it on Facebook, nothing. A man from Tulsa said, I was praying this morning, and I felt the Lord speak to me to send you some money. And then uh, asked for the address at the office and wired 25000 So I learned that day that some money means different things to different people. When I asked my dad for some money, he didn't give me 25000 He gave me like $5. And then there's another guy in Dallas, Texas, that gave us a check for 100000 and uh, the money just kept pouring in, and, and, and I'm going to play just a little clip from that first crusade we did in just a second. But we had 2,564 people give their lives to Jesus Christ in four nights. And we were actually in North Philadelphia in a place called Nice Town that at the time was the second most violent place in Philadelphia and second poorest, and it's one of the ten most violent and, and poorest places in the nation, plus... Um, it was a Muslim-controlled area, which I found out later was why they jacked the price up. But I'm, I'm going to 
play you some awesome testimonies. We had Muslims all over the field. They stayed. They got saved and uh, delivered from drugs. We had mighty miracles. I actually had a private message on Facebook because one night we laid hands on everybody on the field, 2,200 people. It took about an hour and 10 minutes. And a, a young man wrote back to me. He said, my brother came to your meeting when you guys put hands on everybody. You know, they don't even know what it's called. And he said, my brother had AIDS, not HIV, AIDS. The doctor had given him two weeks to live. And he said, when you guys put your hands on him, he felt better. So he went to get checked last week, and his test results came in. There's no AIDS anywhere in his system. And then listen to this. Then he said, he wants to know what trade school you go to to do what you do. Because he said he wants to tell everybody what Jesus did for him, that he was going to die and Jesus healed him and gave him new life. So now he's not only healed, he's studying to go into the ministry all from one miracle. Now I'm going to tell you something. For all the negative news you hear about America and what the devil has planned, I was in uh, Grantville, Pennsylvania, middle of nowhere. If you don't know where it is, join the club. I've been there twice and I still don't know where it is. <laughs> and, you know, I, I pray for America and I, I keep abreast of what's going on. And I was, like, angry about what was going on last year, them passing, legalizing gay marriage, the, 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 all the things that I won't go into today, to collapse the nation, which is intentional. The Bible says there's going to be a one-world government. So why do you think there's such a move for open borders, not just in America, everywhere? They want to do away with national sovereignty and bring everything under a one-world government, one-world ruler, one-world money system, and one-world military. It's all there now. And you can't have a one-world government with strong, independent nations. So there is a deliberate attempt to collapse America. Republican and Democrat are two wings on the same bird. And even well-meaning people, when they get to power, they, found, they find out things are controlled at a higher level. And so they're looking to collapse the nation. Well, I, I was distraught about this. And I was praying, Lord, this isn't right. And I felt the Lord speak to me. Why are you upset? I'm not upset. And then gave me a scripture out of the Psalms that the Lord sits up in heaven, sees the plans of the wicked, and laughs. Do you know God isn't nervous up in heaven? God doesn't have sweat stains on his robe, mopping his brow, wondering what he's going to do about ISIS, wondering what he's going to do about Zika. He's the most high God. And Jesus destroyed all the power of the devil gave that power to the church, which is his body, and put Satan under our feet. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say a better amen? amen. And then that, that's when I felt the Lord speak to me. Don't worry. The devil has a plan to destroy America. But in 2016, I'm going to flip the table on the enemy. And 2016 will be a year of mighty revival all over the United States. And we're already seeing the beginnings of it now. They don't cover it on the news, but I could show you the local news stories. One kid got healed of leukemia on the West Virginia-Kentucky border in a high school. They had given him up to die. Some of the Christian students went and prayed for him, and he got healed. Word came out through the school. They've had 1,500 students saved at several different high schools and middle schools in under two weeks. So listen, you can't stop the Holy Ghost. And God made a promise with all the wicked things that will go on. And, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit today if I ever get to introducing this video. I've got to be careful. I'm not getting into a sermon. I'm just trying to introduce a video and say hello. <laughs> with all the wicked things that Jesus said would come in the last days, you can't get so focused on that that you lose your joy. Because he also said, know this, though it will be very wicked, where wickedness abounds, there the grace and power of God, there much more abounds. And I will build. Not I'll give my church power to survive. Not I'll try to build my church. I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm a part of that church. You're a part of that church. That means we're anointed to grow and to multiply in the face of the devil. That's what this week's about. You're not going down. You're not going to tread water for the rest of your life. You're going from glory to glory, victory to victory, and strength to strength. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. If you believe that with me, take 15 good seconds, clap those hands, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph.
I hear the sound of the armies of the Lord. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> so I just said that to say, the devil's in for a rough 12 months. Be a bad year to be a demon. I would take early pension. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. I'll tell you an old, an old story. There was an evangelist named Tommy Hicks from the United States. I won't go into the whole story, but he supernaturally went down to Argentina when Argentina was a, a straight communist nation tied in with Russia. Got the dictator, General Perón, saved. Then because General Perón was tied in with Russia, he called the Russian government and said, you need to have this guy in. So he went behind the Iron Curtain uh, before, you know, when no one could go. So Tom, everybody say, you can't stop the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, you know, Tommy Hicks was just from the Midwest, not well educated, just a preacher you know, like me. And so he's up there preaching to an auditorium full, big auditorium of Russians that had never heard the gospel. You know, communism at this point had been in almost 100 years. And before that, you had the czars who also wouldn't let anybody preach. So you got a room full of people that never heard about Jesus. So he's preaching. He's got a lady Russian interpreter. Well, what he didn't know was every time he said God is great, she would say communism is great. Every time he would say Jesus is Lord, she would say in Russian, Stalin is king. So he's preaching, wondering why there's no anointing, why nothing's happening. And then he feels the gift of tongues start bubbling up out of his spirit, which you know you're not supposed to do. You're already speaking a language nobody understands and the interpreter doesn't know what to do. He's preaching, but he feels it well up on the inside of him. So he goes into tongues. Goes into tongues like that. As soon as he starts in tongues, about, what, 10, 20 seconds in, the lady interpreter runs down off the stage and runs out the door. Well, now he's stuck up there. You know, he can't speak. So he can't come out of tongues because he can't speak Russian. So he figured, I'll just keep speaking in tongues. So he keeps speaking in tongues. All of a sudden, in unison, the crowd gets up and streams to the altar with tears in their eyes, lifting their hands and praying. So after he finishes praying with them, he goes back and gets the interpreter. He said, what are you doing leaving me on the stage? What do you think I'm paying you for? I don't speak Russian. I need you. She said, sir, I'd be happy to stay up there with you. But you said in perfect Russian, sit down and shut up. And then you preach for 20 minutes in Russian of how Jesus is the only way to heaven. You can't stop the Holy Ghost. The Democrats can do what they want. The Republicans can do what they want. The United Nations can do what they want. The Illuminati can do what they want. But we serve the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and he shall reign forever and ever. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Hallelujah. So I'm happy, and I'm happy to be here because this is a year where God, I, we don't have much time left, and God said before it's all said and done, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, hallelujah, young and old, men and women, and he said all flesh from Central Africa black to Irish white and every shade in between. It's not going to be a youth revival. It's not going to be a revival amongst the old people. It's not going to be a black move. It's not going to be a Spanish move. Even the white people are going to get blessed. God is going to pour his spirit out on everybody. This is the hour of revival in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. So anyway, here's a couple-minute clip. That will show you just one, one powerful testimony of the 2,564 people that got saved those, those uh, four nights. Go ahead and roll it whenever you're ready. Before he healed the leper, he corrected him. I want to. Everybody say, I want to. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I want to. I don't want you to be sick anymore. I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I want to. 
I used to use drugs. Um, I was a crackhead. Be thou made clean. And instantly. Everybody say instantly. How long does it take God? God created the whole world in six days. He won't need more than five minutes to take care of your situation. I used to be Muslim until the night when he was preaching. I just felt like I didn't want to be Muslim no more. Only Jesus can do that. I feel faith on this field. It says you're not going to die. You're going to live. You're not going to struggle. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And I tell you, I know the devil's worked overtime to beat you down, discourage you, but it only takes one night hearing the word of God to say, I shall not die. I shall live and declare the goodness of God while I'm yet in the land of the living. If you're going to do that, one more time, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout with the voice of triumph. I sat there, and the more he preached, I wanted to run and, and jump over the gate like when he said, come up to the altar, I think I was like the fifth one up there. The gods of other religions, they all say, if you're sick, that's your problem. You're sick for a reason. It's not for you to question. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life. It's the thief that came to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But something kept me here tonight, and, and I still don't want to go. And like I was telling you, I'm ready to, to pack my bags and travel with y'all and preach to somebody else what I've been through. Tell somebody else my story, and if he could bring me out, he could bring you out. Can you say amen? So we started off with about 2,200 on the field. You know, no, if all the churches in Philadelphia would have boycotted the meeting, it probably would have affected attendance by about 15 people. They were all raw, raw, unsaved people. I never preached to so many people smoking at once. <laughs> We've got a, a, a park right in the Section 8 housing. By the second night, people started to carry their couches out at about 4 p.m. and put them all over the field. And then uh, it was about 85 degrees out at night. No one moved. I thought they'd move. So the first night I preached 35 minutes. The last night I preached an hour and a half. Nobody moved. And that last night we had 774 people saved. Like, like her. I don't know if you've ever seen a Muslim woman take her burqa and pull it off and jump a fence and come up to receive Jesus. But it's a pretty awesome sight. And then the fact you find out later she was a crack addict and her crack addiction totally left her. We serve a mighty God. I'm not in charge of immigration policies in the United States, but I'm going to tell you, if they think they can overrun the nation sending in Muslims, we could get them saved faster than they can ship them in. I can tell you this. If the devil's stupid enough to send people from a place where they can't hear the gospel to a place where they can. I was preaching in Helsinki, Finland in February, and we had one Iraqi man get saved. But you don't get to preach to Iraqis in the United States much. So one got saved. He brought two of his friends the next night. They all got saved. By the last night, we had three, uh, two rows of Iraqi men that had gotten saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. So I know in my spirit there's going to be Syrian evangelists, Iraqi evangelists, Iranian evangelists. See, people can't separate the two. It's like when, if you criticize the Pope, people think you hate Catholics. If you, if you talk about uh, Islam, people think you hate Muslims. But it's not the people. It's the system that keeps people bound. And Jesus came so people could be set free. And you can see that was only one video. So it doesn't matter whether it's Islam, crack addiction, AIDS, whatever the bondage is, the thing that the anointing does, the Bible says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to say to the prisoner, not only people in minimum security or medium security prison, no matter how locked down they are in prison, the name of Jesus breaks every hold of every prison. And I want to tell you here, I mean, we're talking about Philadelphia. Everybody that's here in Jacksonville, whatever you came in here with, that you think, man, I wish maybe I can talk to him after the service and get special prayer. You don't need special prayer. All you need to do is be present while this word is being preached. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it alone is the power of God at work. You know, I never prayed for that Muslim. Just hearing the gospel, she took that off and the crack addiction left her. No extra prayer. The power of God set her free. And the same power that set her free is here today to set you free. No one leaves here bound today. You leave here free in the name of Jesus Christ. One last thing and then I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a sermon. You know, you have God open that thing up to you in Philadelphia and you wonder, what are you going to do now? Because once it's over, it's over. And I had that same old preacher, Brother Farina, waiting under the bridge where we parked the cars, all graffitied and busted down. He was there in a dress shirt, dress pants, and dress shoes. And I got out of the car. I knew he lived 45 minutes from there, and he's 80 years old. I said, Pastor Farina, you don't have to come hear me preach. You're already saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. I can't help you. And he said, I'm not here to hear you preach. I'm here because the Lord gave me a word to give you. Well, he had never given me a word, and I've known him four years. So I, I lifted my hands. He said, God says that he's been seeing what you're doing here. And because you're going after people nobody wants, he's very pleased. So now he's going to send another mayor from another city that's going to run and beg you to come to his city. Well, I thought, you know, mayors don't beg people like me. I mean, what, what can I do? And so I thought maybe he's using poetic language to make it sound more prophetic. But I got off the stage the one night and went around back to get some water and a man in a black t-shirt and black pants about 60 years old ran full speed and wrapped both arms around me. And so, you know, I'm not really accustomed to that. Even like with my dad, we kind of hug from the side for like less than a second. And then if you hug longer than that, it'd be like, what's your problem? <laughs> so he wrapped both arms around me tight. And he said, you must take this to my city. Well, I, I've had a lot of people ask me to take it to their city. So I, I was about to tell him, well, you know, just find out who's ever in charge of the city and we'll, go, we'll, we'll, we'll get it rolling. He said, I'm the mayor of Vineland, New Jersey. I'll give you any venue you want. I'll give you any permits you want. Just promise that you'll do this. My city needs this. So we'll be there in, uh, when, I think that's the first one we do, next month. And uh, same thing. Then Kensington, Philadelphia, one district over invited us. In North Philadelphia, the most violent, the poorest part of Philadelphia. You know, it's very clear to see that Satan would like to destroy the cities of America and the inner cities in particular. But if you get people with Jesus in their heart, the Bible says when you receive Jesus, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. So if you get police officers saved, there won't be co corrupt police officers. If you get people in the inner city saved, you can't have Jesus in your heart and beat someone. You can't have Jesus in your heart and burn a gas station down. So if you get people genuinely saved, then every strategy the enemy has to destroy the cities of America, we're going to flip it right on his head. Can you say amen? So I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm very excited. This is going to be the best year that you've ever had in Jesus' name. I tell you, whether you want it to be or not, this is going to be the best year that you've ever had in Jesus' name. If you wanted to have a bad year, you, did a, 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 you messed up coming here today. I'll tell you that. Because God will turn everything around for your good in 30 minutes in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe in that, God with me. Clap those hands one more time and let them hear you in advance. Matthew chapter 24. This will just set a tone for this week. Matthew 24, verse 3. Matthew, the 24th chapter in the third verse, the Bible says, Later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will all of this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Now, I want to pause there because I don't think most people, I know most people, and I don't think most church people or preachers have a grasp of the fact that Jesus is coming back. It's the thing that separates Jesus from everyone else. I've picked on Islam a lot today, so I might as well take another shot at it. Every year, they wheel Muhammad's bones out in a glass case in Mecca and pay homage to their founder. Buddha's dead. 
Buddha, they know where he died. I always thought Buddha was a little chubby for somebody so big on self-discipline. <laughs> Buddha's dead. Muhammad's dead. The Hindu gods never came to earth. But Jesus, when they said, how will we know you're the son of God? Jesus said, I will allow this temple to be torn down. But three days later, my father will give me power to pick it back up again. And so the Bible says the disciples didn't even believe or understand what he was talking about. Because on the third day, they went to the tomb to follow Jewish burial practices and anoint the body again. And a discussion arose between the women. Who are we going to get to roll the stone aside? But when they came upon the tomb, the stone was already rolled away. They still didn't get it. So they ran in, saw the burial clothes laying there, and the face cloth neatly folded, the Bible says at the top. Jesus made his bed before he left. Jesus was an interesting guy. Who borrows a tomb? The Bible says he borrowed a tomb. Can you imagine going down to a graveyard in Jacksonville and saying, how much is it for a burial plot? $5,200. How much to lease one for three days? They're going to give you a jacket with your arms tied behind your back and send you off to a hospital to get some rest. But the Bible says Jesus borrowed the tomb. They came in, and he's not there, so they still don't get it. The lady starts crying, and a man who she thought was the gardener said, what are you crying about? She said, they've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. She thought they stole his body. But that man she thought was the gardener was an angel. And the angel said, why seek ye the living among the dead? For the Jesus that you're looking for is not here, but he is alive and he lives forevermore. Now go tell everyone. So when people say, why can't you Christians keep your beliefs to yourself? It's against our beliefs to keep our beliefs to ourselves. We're under orders to go tell everybody. Then the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, Jesus was blessing the disciples. And then suddenly gravity lost its hold on him. And he starts to ascend. We used to do this day at our church growing up where you'd let all the balloons go. And I remember as a little kid, you'd just stand and see how long you could look at him. The Bible says that's what the disciples did. They just kept watching Jesus. I can still see him. That's him. If you look to the left of the cloud, they probably would have died there. I know what would have happened if those two angels didn't show up and tell them to get moving. They would have made two gold footprints, and you'd go pay somebody in Israel $75. They'd have a little 15-second egg timer, and you'd get to go to oh, the last place Jesus ever stood. But they didn't want it to turn into a relic. Two white-robed men appeared and said, Why stand ye here gazing into the sky, straining your eyes? For one day, listen to this, one day, just as you saw him go, he will come back. And I, I don't think that's real to people. Because, and you know, that's why you see so many commercials uh, and, and politicians up in arms about saving the earth. Because if you're not saved, this is the only earth you have. But the Bible says there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And actually, the new earth, if this sounds new to you, I promise you, this is straight Methodist, Presbyterian, full God. doesn't matter what you are. This is straight Bible doctrine. And thank God for all the sermons on three keys on managing your time and how to set boundaries in your personal life. But this is the message of the day. Because I'm going to show you from the Bible, not only is Jesus coming back again, but the Bible says there will be signs to know when his return is near, even at the door. We started two churches in Hawaii on the back end of Maui. And uh, it's where all the original Hawaiians live. And they told me going back there, I felt the Lord call me back there. They said, those people aren't going to listen to you. I mean, I've heard that everywhere I've gone. They told me they won't listen to me in Philadelphia because I'm white. They told me in Hawaii they won't listen to me because I'm white. Because they hate white people. Because uh, the United States, I'm just telling you what they told me. I found out later, they, they at least like one white person. The United States took Hawaii over. It was a kingdom, and then people had to pay taxes on land that they had owned, so they're mad. So there's actually a Hawaiian sovereignty movement to break away from the United States and be their own people again. So we're staying back there where I started the church, and I rented a house. Well, the guy that I thought was the groundskeeper, it turned out he was the guy that rented us the house, that owns the house. Big Hawaiian, long hair. 
I said, uh, so just to be nice, you know, I said, hey, I want to tell you, the house is really clean, very nice, the, the, the yard's immaculate, thanks for renting the house to us. He said, are you the preacher? Well, when I was younger, I used to just say yes, but I've learned a few things. Now I say, and why do you ask? <laughs> he said, uh, no, I know you're the preacher. I saw you on, on the, uh, somebody gave me an invitation. He said, if God is so, he said, no, he said, I'm mad at God. I said, well, that's not smart. You know I'm anointed. It was the anointing talking because the guy was so, I mean, look at me anyway. I had to get so many links taken out of this watch. There's men in here that could wear it as a pinky ring. So I'm not one inclined to mouth off to people. And so I said, well, that's stupid to be mad at God. I said, even if he's wrong, what court do you plan on taking him to? Can't take God to Judge Judy. He's the most high God. So it's best to just fall in line. He said, no, I'm mad because our land was taken away from us. Why would God allow us to lose our land to the United States? I said, well, let me tell you something. Do you know about Jesus? He said, I know about him. I said, you know about how he died and rose again? Yeah. I said, where did he go after he rose? Well, I said, I'll tell you where he went. The Bible says he ascended into heaven, never died again. And the Bible says he's coming back. And I said, I don't know. I'm going to sh share with you what I shared with him. I ran through some prophetic signs that are as clear as day that when you see this happening, it's never happened before, you'll know that his return is near. I said, did you know Jesus is going to come back? And when he comes back, he's going to come back with everybody that's received him as their Lord and Savior, set up a kingdom on this earth out of Jerusalem. There'll be a new Jerusalem that comes down. And from that spot, Jesus will rule this earth from there. And we will rule and reign with him. I said, so if I were you, rather than be mad at God, I would get saved, and then when we come back, put in a request that you can be in charge of Maui. He scrunched up his forehead and went, what time did you say you're preaching again? You know, if you watch television, Hollywood, whatever, they make heavens. No wonder people aren't interested in going. They make it seem like it's going to be some ghost land. People don't even know what they're going to look like. The Bible says you'll be known as you're known. The reason we don't cremate as Christians, the reason we do what they call a proper Christian burial is part of redemption was that the Lord redeemed these bodies. And one day there'll be a trumpet sound. The dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet them in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. You'll be in this body. It's just that this body will be glorified. So I'm not saying if you say, well, anytime I say that, I have people wait after. I had my aunt cremated, so don't worry about it. The Lord will be able to sort it out. Because a lot of the martyrs got cremated, uh, uh, you know, burned alive, heads cut off. But the reason we didn't decimate bodies and bury your grandfather in his Sunday suit holding the Bible, it was an anticipation that though that body's in the ground, that's not their final home. There will be a trumpet call. I mean, think of it. When Jesus died, the Bible says when he gave up the ghost, the veil in the temple was torn top to bottom, and the tombs of many godly Jews came open. At Matthew 27, I know this sounds like I'm making up my own religion, but I promise you it's in there. It's like the verses they skip in Sunday school. The tombs of many godly Jews came open, and they walked around Jerusalem for several hours. So the resurrection life of God is we're going to be taken out of this earth. There's going to be something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to get a meal. I've been preaching so much, I might get mine to go and just go back to my mansion and lay down. Amen. <laughs> I don't know if they have styrofoam containers up there. Basically, there's an event called the rapture, which is before the second coming. In the rapture, Christ comes for the church. He never touches down. There's a calling up and catching away out of the earth. Then the worst seven years that the world has ever known will follow. Where a man that the Bible, he won't be Joe Antichrist. They call him the Antichrist because he'll set himself against every law there is. One world government, one world money system where no man can buy or sell unless they're given a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Which has already been on the Today Show. There was a company called Verichip. I was watching it. They said it can hold all your medical information all your financial information, protect against fraud. And Matt Lauer said, what if somebody doesn't have a hand? 
And I knew from, I could answer that when I was six years old. From growing up in church, I yelled at the TV, they put it in your head. And then he said, they put it at the base of your scalp, right, right at the top of your forehead. And so that chip that you have and all the new credit cards, they're basically waiting for the old people that know better to die off and the young generation that'll just, whatever makes it easier, put it in. But you know the problem about all your money being in your hand? is if they don't like what you're doing, they just turn your chip off. And no man can buy or sell unless they're given a mark in their right hand or their right forehead. Which if you, st if you follow the G20 summit every year, the 20 most powerful economic nations meet in Davos, Switzerland, and say, we're now in a global economy. We can't have strong independent economies. We need to bring everything. So when you see that, it's, it's a sign. You understand? You don't, you, it, it's a waste of time to pray against it. You don't pray against, when, when God tells you a flood's coming, you don't pray against the flood, you build an ark and you get your family in that boat so that when the rain starts to fall and washes everybody away that thought the word of God was nuts, I don't believe that crap, Noah got in the boat, got in his family, and they were spared. That's a type of what God's going to do. That salvation. There is a call going out right now. You don't have to go down with the ship. You're not like everybody else. You don't have to live like everybody else. Jesus died for you. You can call on him, and he'll save you today. Can you say amen? So then there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. You'll look just glorified version of you. Your family will be there. Nobody will get tired. Nobody will get old. The Bible says there is no crying. Trying to bring tears into heaven is like trying to bring heroin into the United States. They run you through a scanner before you go to heaven. All tears are confiscated. All sorrows confiscated. All pain is confiscated. All sickness, all cancer, all everything that came in with the old order is taken away. And the joy of being with Jesus in his presence is fullness of. So it's just nonstop joy. You're not standing on a cloud playing a harp. No wonder nobody wants to go to heaven. Who would want to do that? You don't even know how to play the harp. It'd be like being in band class in third grade. You just have to fake Hey, your fingers aren't even touching this. I know, I don't let, they just gave this to me. No, there'll be a heaven up there that the Bible says the pleasures that will be there are so great, there's nothing to reference them to on earth. And then after the tribulation, when the Antichrist at the tail end of the tribulation surrounds Israel to wipe it off the face of the map, Jesus will come back down on a white horse and all of those that went up with him will ride behind him on a white horse. He's not going to have a two-year fight with the devil. The Bible says he will destroy the Antichrist by the breath of his mouth and the splendor of his coming. He'll deliver Israel and set up his kingdom on this earth. When you get that in your spirit, nothing here has any attachment to you except people. Because it's all going away anyway. Money, I have a lot of money. It takes a lot of money to do what we do. But money's a tool to get the gospel out to help people. That's it. Homes are a place to lay down at night. I don't, trust me, and I've proven it with my giving. I don't have any attachment to anything. The Lord could ask me to give anything, and it'd be gone in, in, in a minute. I wouldn't even wrestle. First of all, if you understand the law of seed time and harvest, you get a better one anyway. I was sitting next to a drunk lady in first class, and she said, I've been talking. Oh, she sure had. From before wheels up, four straight hours, never took a breath. And she goes, I've been talking all this time. What do you do for a living? I hate telling people what I do for a living because then you have to hear their thoughts on preachers. and so Sometimes I just don't feel like, but I told her. I said, I'm a minister. I'm a minister. Sitting in first class? I thought you people were supposed to give all your money to the poor. I said, I've been trying to give all my money to the poor. It keeps coming back. <laughs> feed 800 kids a day. The more kids we feed, the more money comes. It's insane. Do you know, actually, as of this month, our largest expense in our ministry is giving to other ministries. It's now at 42% of what comes in goes out. I do that selfishly. 
Because the more you give, the more comes back. Can you say amen? amen. But you ask me. I, this watch was given to me. This shirt was given to me. This tie was given to me. And this suit was given to me. And the rest is none of your business. <laughs> so I'm not talking po like taking an oath of poverty. You need money to do what God's called you to do. But you're not living to pay bills. You're not living so you can take a vacation to Myrtle Beach or whatever. You're living, God, now that I'm saved, how can I best use my life to rescue people out of the kingdom of darkness and bring them to heaven? When you pray that prayer, Jesus said, seek ye first, Matthew 6, the kingdom of God, the establishing of the kingdom of God. And when you do all the other things that you could be going after instead, I will just add them unto you. So I tell you one more time, get ready for the best year that you've ever had in the name of Jesus Christ. Anybody see where I put my Bible? I need it, not only for today, I need it like basically till the Jesus comes. I should get a fluorescent orange one. So, everybody say second coming. Say Jesus is coming back. Now, the disciples said, how will we know when you're coming back? If you ask that question when I was growing up in church, they basically would give you the same answer that went something like this. Well, no man knows the day or the hour. He could come today. He could come a thousand years from now. The important thing is just to be ready. As if that's how Jesus answered the question. That's one verse in one of the longest chapters where when they said, how can we know when you're coming back? Jesus said, well, don't worry. He said, I'll tell you. So listen, Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. But don't panic. Yes, these things must follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is only the first of birth pains with more to come. So people say, oh yeah, but there's always been famines. There's always been earthquakes. Jesus, uh, Jesus likened it to a woman's labor pains, which I found out three and a half years ago. When they start, they don't go away. And it's useless. You don't pray. Lord, just take these labor pains away. They start, then they get stronger in intensity and closer together. So when you hear things like, there's only been one tidal wave in the last 500 years, and now there's been three in the last decade. We've never seen anything like that before. It amazes me how stupid people can be on TV. You'd think if every scientific discovery was, we've never seen earthquakes here. Earthquake in Bar Harbor, Maine. There's no record of there ever being an earthquake. Earthquake in Indiana. Earthquakes where there's no fault lines. We've never seen that before. We don't know what's happening. They, they don't know what's happening because they refuse to listen to people like me. Every time I hear them say it on CNN, I yell, I could help you if you'd listen. They don't want to listen. Jesus said if you're wise, you won't say, oh, can't believe this is a, you'll look up. For your redemption is drawing nigh. Look what it says. Then you'll be arrested, persecuted, and killed all over the world. And if we don't get people saved, it'll happen here. Nature abhors vacuum. If you won't preach the gospel and get people saved, there won't be emptiness. Something else will move in and will stamp Christianity out. It's happening in Europe right now. It'll happen in Canada very soon, and as long as I'm breathing, it will not happen here Amen. because I know how to throw the devil out. Believe, I, you can throw him out of a person, you can throw him out of a city, and you can throw him out of a nation. And I tell you one more time, these next 12 months from Boston, Massachusetts to Maui, Hawaii, from International Falls, Minnesota to Laredo, Texas, this nation is not going to be destroyed. God is going to send a mighty move of the Holy Ghost that's going to bring families back together, that's going to set heroin addicts free, that's going to set Vicodin addicts free. This is not the hour for the devil to take over. This is the hour of the moving of God and Jacksonville shall not be left out. This is the hour of our visitation. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers. That, that's now. Who would have thought the day would come in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania 
where you'd get treated like Adolf Hitler when they found, what do you want to use the park for? To preach. Why do you have to do that? Do you ask the gay rights movement why they have to use the park? I told the crusade director, next time we go to get the permit, I'm going to show up in a pair of cut-off jean shorts with my dress shirt tied up around my navel and tell them it's for gay pride. They'll probably donate it to me. <laughs> Be, I know you're laughing. I, I've tried not to be funny. I, but the Bible says in Isaiah, the day will come where men will call evil good and good evil. Why do these preachers have to spread that? How come every, there was a message in the Washington Post this week during National Day of Prayer, this last week. The title of the article was, on this National Day of Prayer, dear Christians, keep your prayers to yourself. <laughs> Have you ever read an article telling any other group of people to keep their belief or whatever to themselves? You ever hear, dear, on this gay pride day, dear gays and lesbians, keep your beliefs to yourself. Why do you have to parade in the street? Do you ever hear on the month of Ramadan, dear Muslims, keep your prayers inside? How come in this era of tolerance, it's oak, everything's supposed to be acceptable until you love Jesus? Then I'll oh, shut up. I wish those people didn't know. Why do they have to spread that hate? Hate? Message of a man coming from heaven to die for you? That when they were putting the nails in his hands, said, Father, don't hold this against them. They don't know what they're doing. Message of hate? Jesus said, when you see it get to that point where you will be hated all over the world because of your allegiance to me and arrested and persecuted because you're my followers. And I'm just talking about America. I can tell you stories from overseas that would make, make your hair stand up. Easter Sunday in Pakistan, blow up a church. 600 people dead. Little girl missing her leg on Easter. Jesus said, when you see it hit that level, you better wake up because everything is not going to stay like it is. When they said, how will we know when your return it will be and the end of the world? Jesus said, oh, there won't be an end of the world. Just relax. He said, I'll tell you. So we're there. Then look at this, 14. But the gospel, or 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. 12 said, sin will be rampant everywhere and will cause the love of many. Think of this, because sin's all over the place, it'll cause people that once had a hot love for God. Sin will come in, like it did for Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 3, and Solomon so loved the Lord that that night he offered 700 burnt offerings or 1,000 burnt offerings. Then you catch up with Solomon in chapter 11. And Solomon loved many strange women and they turned his heart away from God. Sin will be rampant everywhere causing many people that once had a hot love for God, their love will grow cold. But he who endures till the end shall be saved. Lift your hands all across this auditorium. Receive grace today to endure to the end. If you receive it, shout aloud, amen. amen. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. For the sake of time, skip to verse 32. I'm going to show you the main sign. Matthew 24, 32. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happen, you can know that my return is near, even at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation shall not pass until all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. What was Jesus talking about? I can tell you what every one of his Jewish hearers knew he was talking about. Because if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, their mothers start having arguments. Hey, listen, all these blind people getting healed, that's great. But when are you going to kick the Roman government out of here and make Israel a nation again? Israel had been taken over. They knew the Messiah would restore Israel's kingdom. 
So Jesus, let's get the show on the world road. Let my son be at your right hand. Can my son be a governor? Jesus said it's not time for that now. But I will tell you this. When the fig tree buds again, most Christians in here are going to know it. What nation did the fig tree refer to? Israel. When you see Israel bud again, when Israel becomes a nation again, the generation that sees Israel become a nation will not pass. That means the people that were alive to see Israel reborn will still be here when I come again. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. Did you know if you buy any Bible prophecy book written before World War II, they will say at the bottom, even though Jesus was referring to Israel becoming a nation again, this must have another meaning because it's impossible. When an, and they're right. When a nation goes away, it never comes back again. The Ottoman Empire, gone. Nation goes away, gone. They don't come back. There are people in are married. They adopt the cultures of where they come from, and they're gone. But the Jewish people, in fulfillment of prophecy, under heavy persecution for 2,000 years in exile, wore their clothes, celebrated their feasts, taught their sons to only marry Jewish women, the Jewish women to only, their daughters to only marry Jewish men. And then Satan knew if he could keep this prophecy from being fulfilled. It's why he loaded Canaan with giants. It's why he passed a law through Herod for all sons two years and younger to be killed in Bethlehem. So he raises up Hitler to, with one mission, to use the mightiest military on earth to eradicate the Jews so that Israel could never be a nation again. But just like he always does, Satan's best plans backfire hardest. Hitler died in the United Nations. May 14th, 1948, redrew the lines of Israel and 7.5 million Jews returned from all over the world. And the other prophecy in the Old Testament, can a nation be born in one day? Israel didn't have to fight to get that land back. The nation was born in one day. Jesus said, if you're intelligent, when you see that happen, wake up for the generation. That means a group of people that are alive on the earth at one time. The people that are alive to see that will still be alive when I come back. 1948, May 14th, we're coming up on the anniversary. Meaning the youngest, if they were a baby, will be over 68 years old. The youngest. So though there's a time of grace extended for people to get saved, that time of grace has a limitation on it because Jesus said, "For when I come back, there'll still be people then alive. Time is running out. How will you know when I'm coming back again? Number one, Israel reborn. Number two, I, I, I'll just make this a sub point of number one. Everybody say nations reborn. Then the Bible says in Ezekiel 38, there'll be a battle called Armageddon where after Israel's reborn, it tells you the specific nations, namely it's Ezekiel 38, 1 to 6, Russia and Persia, which is Iraq and Iran, will unite together to make war against Israel. If you read it, Zechariah 14, 2 Peter 3, nuclear war. When I saw Iran negotiating with America for the rights to develop nuclear weapons, and our government, you saw Benjamin Netanyahu came over from Israel and pleaded with our government, don't let them get these weapons. They're not doing it for nuclear power. They're doing it to wipe us off the face of the earth. And our government, I never thought I'd see the day where America would ally with Arab nations against Israel. But it had to happen for Jesus to come back. So when you see it happen, so you'd think the church would be jammed. You'd think we'd have to do four services, balcony and floor filled. Why isn't everybody running in to get saved? Because you want to know what the lead news story was? I was in Pittsburgh the, the, when the negotiations took place. I thought, man, they're not going to be able to, to, to ignore this. We're a half step from Armageddon. And by the way, Armageddon is at the end of the tribulation. So if you see the signs for Armageddon, how much closer is the rapture? If you see signs in the mall for Christmas sales, how much closer is Thanksgiving? These are the signs 
for what's going to happen at the end of the seven years. That's why that, how do you think a little nobody like me can call on God and get a park and get all those people saved and have money come in from everywhere? Because the Lord is waiting so people have time to be saved. So if you'll make it your business to rescue the lost, God will back you with the full might of heaven. I'm in, I'm in Pittsburgh. I thought, well, this, this will have to be the lead story on the news. I mean, this is like World War III is getting ready to happen. Lead story on the news. What the Pittsburgh Steelers have to do to make the NFL playoffs this year. 54 minutes of sports, entertainment. If Kanye West had smoothed things over with Taylor Swift. Now, I'm going to say this. I probably should wait till the last day to say something like this. But you live in one dumb generation. Starbucks in one hand, phone in the other. The Bible says that day will catch people unaware. Do you know it's Hitler's playbook? Get the people more interested in entertainment and sports than they are in politics, and you can do anything you want. And that's where you live right now. You live in a, you, you pull any 16-year-old over and ask them about anything I've talked about. They want to know it. They don't tell them in public school, nothing. But then you ask them. They can tell you the starting quarterback, backup quarterback, all three starting receivers on every NFL team. They play fantasy football or whatever. I had a mom bring her son up and say, can you pray for my son? He has a learning disability. I said, no, he doesn't. She said, no, they said he doesn't. I said, I don't care what they said. Do you play fantasy football? Tell your mother, the starting quarterback on every team in the NFL, then tell her all three receivers, two running backs, two tight ends, and a kicker. Do it. She, he told, I said, okay, so he's not too dumb, is he? He just rattled off the full names of 170 players. It's not that people are stupid. It's that the devil has misdirected their attention on the things that don't matter. People, people know what the... Jaguars have to do in the draft. People are mad that they haven't fired the coach or which coach they've hired. But I want to tell you something. Jesus said, Mark chapter 8, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in the process? There really is a heaven. There really is a hell. You're going to spend your eternity in one of those two places. And I came to Florida to plead with you. Don't go down with the ship. Jesus died for you. It's time to get serious. Make your reservation. So so that when Christ comes back, you're coming back with him. Number one, rebirth of nations. Number two, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it'll be in the days when the Son of Man comes. What was it like in Noah's day? You just flip back to Genesis 6. Men's hearts were desperately wicked. And all they ever thought about was violence. Everybody say intense violence. There's never a group like ISIS before. They don't even have a goal. Just kill. They're not the only ones. MS-13, street gang coming in from El Salvador. They don't even deal drugs or anything. Just kill. Somebody walk into a middle school, shoot 20 kids dead. The stupid government thinks it's a, a gun control problem. It's a devil. Jesus said, when you see that violence loose, you can make guns illegal. The guns are illegal in Pakistan, you know. Do you know all guns are illegal in Mexico? Take guns away. People make bombs. Pack a 1987 Toyota Corolla filled with C4. It's what they do overseas. Violence. Hate. You can see that now. Amen. Christians getting in arguments with each other over which Republican candidate they thought. She won't talk to people anymore. You know, I did an amazing thing the other day. It is a miracle. I read something I disagreed with on Facebook and moved on with my life. You know, there used to be a day when you could disagree with someone without wanting to kill them. <laughs> Calm down. You'll live longer. Violence. Hate. 
I'm not joking around. There is a spirit of hatred loose in this country. And you better make up your mind today. That spirit's not going to find a home in me. Only love, peace, joy, righteousness, kindness, gentleness. I don't want that spirit. I want the Holy Ghost. You, you can't make me hate black people. You can't make me hate Spanish people. And by the grace of God, you can't even make me hate white people. God's done such a work in my heart that I even love them. How do you hate a whole group of people? That's a devil. If you think a bunch of religious leaders are going to solve it, meeting together at a conference room for free donuts and coffee and posing for a picture on Instagram. We had very uh, constructive dialogue today. Shut up. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. The only thing that's going to lift hatred out of people's heart, the Bible says when Jesus comes into a heart, the love of God is shed abroad in their heart. We don't need more dialogue. We need a revival of the Spirit of God flooding the inner cities, flooding the suburbs, filling people's hearts with the love of Jesus Christ. Number one, rebirth of nations, specifically Israel. Number two, violence, unprecedented violence. Number three, I just spoke in a Philadelphia public school two weeks ago. I had to clear two metal detectors to get into the auditorium. More than, more than an airplane. Two biggest problems in school used to be chewing gum and talking. They, I'm, I'm not joking around. They used to have parent-teacher conferences on how to address those two problems. They also used to open prayer in school, uh, school with prayer every day. The devil knew if he could take that out, then he could run in. One woman full of the devil, Madeline Murray O'Hare, made it her mission and succeeded to get prayer taken out of every public school. So if one woman full of the devil can do that, what can one woman full of the Holy Ghost do to mark her generation? Every mother that's here, every woman that's here, God doesn't just anoint you to keep your family together. God will put an anointing on you to shake Florida, to shake the South, to shake your nation with the power of God. Number one, nations. Number two, violence. Number three, as it was in the days of Lot, so it will be in the days when the Son of Man comes back. Luke chapter 17 and Luke chapter 21. What was it like in Lot's day? Two cities obsessed with sexual perversion, in particular homosexuality. So Jesus said, when you see a culture get obsessed, you thought gay marriage was going to be the end of it. Now nobody even knows which bathroom to use anymore. You know, four years ago, everybody knew where to take a pee. So when you see, can you, I saw Franklin Graham put on Twitter that a man should, have, should use a man's bathroom and a woman use a woman's bathroom. I wrote above it. The fact that someone had to take time to type this is absolute insanity. So Jesus said, when you see the culture get obsessed, invent new ways to have sexual perversion. You can know my return is near even at the door. Number four, turn to Matthew 25, and I'll close there. Matthew, the 25th chapter. I could give you more signs, but this is where I want to close. Matthew 25, 1 to 13. Jesus said, and remember, this is chapter 25, the chapter after 24 where he told about signs of his return. Then he goes into this story. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps, went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil, because our lamps are running out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready 
went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, the other five bridesmaids returned. They stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't even know who you are. So you too must keep watch and be prepared all the time for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Turn over to Revelation 3. Revelation 3, 14. Write this letter to the church of Laodicea. Everybody say to the church. So this is written to Christians. So for all the preachers that say, oh, don't worry. If you're saved, grace will cover all. Then why did Jesus make a special trip back and make John write letters to seven churches to tell them, I know what you're doing. And if you don't clean things up, you're going to split hell wide open. Any grace that tells you not to worry about sin is not a grace from heaven. It's a grace from hell. Grace is not a covering for sin. Grace is an empowerment to live in victory over all the power of the devil. Grace is not a thing. It's a person. It's Jesus. No, it's not. Grace is a person named Jesus. So when the Bible says, and Jesus was full of grace, it was Jesus was full of himself. <laughs> Secondly, if grace is a covering for sin, why would Jesus have been full of grace? Because he never sinned. Grace is not a covering for you living against God. Grace is an empowerment by the Holy Ghost to live with your foot on the neck of the devil all the days of your life. Lift your hands all over this room. Every sin, every public sin that people know about, every private sin you've been battling that you haven't told anyone, I tell you as a servant of the Most High God, in Jesus' name, receive grace to live in victory. You leave here free today in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe it, shout amen like thunder. Say this out loud. I will not live under sin. I will live in victory over sin. In Jesus' name. I know all the things you do, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that's been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you won't be ashamed of your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so you'll be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Indifference is what's going to send the majority of Americans to hell. Now, I believe what he said, but we did tell Aunt, Aunt Martha, you know, that we'd meet her at Longhorn. We got to, it's just, just no, no care. Indifferent. They don't hate God. I believe in God. Oh, yeah. Good, oh, sure. But they, nothing moves them to take life seriously. I am a product of a father that took our home seriously and a mother that took our home seriously. We weren't allowed to sin. They didn't have to pray for God to deal with us. They dealt with us <laughs> harshly. I had my principal call me in one day and tell me, I'm calling all, we, me and a group of like four kids got in trouble. He said, I'm calling all of their parents, but I'm not calling your dad. I'm going to give you one more chance because I know their parents are going to sit them in time out and your parents are going to make you where you're unable to sit for a long time. <laughs> I'm glad my dad did that. I'm glad my dad taught me to be diligent and my mother to serve God all the days of my life. I'm glad they weren't pushing me around in a stroller with a cigarette hanging out of their mouth. 
going to get heroin. Like I see you driving all over the place now. Man, when I see, now that I have a kid, and I see how kids are getting raised, but they don't know God, the parents. Those kids don't have a chance. There must be this week, not sometime. We have to have a move of the Holy Ghost to set every prisoner free. And we're going to have it this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Say this out loud. Say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the only way you do You don't say, as for me and my house, we're going to try to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, if they'll move the soccer tournament, we're going to start coming on Sundays. God will not be something on your to-do list when your schedule's clear and you can make it and if you can get work off. You see Muslims going to mosque five times a day to go pray. People can't clear out 90 minutes of a 168-hour week to be found in God's house to lift up praise unto them. They got a problem. Jesus will either be everything or he'll be nothing at all. You have to make, I would that you be hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, Jesus has more respect for a devout atheist. At least they've made up their mind. Then somebody that comes in every once in a while, keep me in prayer, and they know that there's things that are askew in their life, that the Holy Spirit's convicted them of several times. And instead of getting and dealing with it, they got around other people that struggle with the same thing. Support groups. Oh, yeah, we do battle that. Oh, yes, let's talk about it every Monday in the church basement till Jesus comes back. They're going to get left behind because God said, I want you to be hot. I don't want you to be cold, and I don't want you to dabble in sin. Listen, you have to make up your world. If you live like Jacksonville, if you live like America, you will share American problems and you'll head where America's going. You have to make up your mind. I live here, but I'm not of here. I am born again. I am transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost and sin shall not live in dominion over me. I will live in dominion over sin. If you make that your, your goal, if you've made up your mind to do that, take 15 seconds, clap those hands and shout unto God one more time. Come on, let heaven hear you. Clap your hands, all ye people. Enough is enough. You have to let the fire of God burn in your spirit. It'll keep you from sin. It'll burn the desire for sin out of your mouth. It'll burn the desire. Man, we stay in nice hotels. And we usually check in Saturday night to start church Sunday. I walk by clubs and dances every week. I've never looked in there and thought, boy, I could be doing that. But I don't see these out of shape people. <laughs> it doesn't look like TV. It doesn't look like the beer commercials. TV's fake. You're not Kim Kardashian. People are chasing this fake life that doesn't exist. <laughs> Next song. No wonder everybody drinks and does drugs. If I had to listen to that music for four minutes, I'd probably give it a whirl. You walk by that and listen to that, there's no anointing on it. It sounds like hell. The place looks like hell. The people smell like hell. Why are you chasing a life that leads to hell till you take your soul seriously? Nothing's going to work right. Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. People, you, let me tell you, you think you can just basically do a little bit and get to heaven? No. Broad is the way that leads to destruction for the many that choose the easy way. But the road, the path that leads to heaven is straight and it's narrow and few there be that walk thereon. No, you can go to hell by accident. 
There's going to be a lot of people in hell getting explained to them why they're there. But nobody gets to heaven by accident. Hell is a prepared place for a determined people that have made up their mind. I refuse to go to hell. I refuse for my children to go to hell. I receive Jesus Christ. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Stand on your feet, everybody. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in. And when Jesus steps in, every devil steps out. It's not you getting saved and then I'll keep me in prayer. I, no! Listen to that Muslim woman. She had been saved less than 30 minutes. I don't have any desire for crack. I don't want to be a Muslim anymore. Can I pack my bags and preach with you? We're not selling religion. We're not selling going to church more. Before you need a church, you need a change. And only the blood of Jesus can make that change. You're leaving here changed by the power of God, never to be the same again. If you know that's true, let heaven hear you one more time. Clap those hands and shout unto God. Hey! There's going to be many mothers here today that get a gift that K Jewelers can't make. You're going to get a gift of your sins being forgiven, the power of sin being broken, everything that comes along as a buddy with sin, depression, fear panic attacks. God is going to break that over your head. Drive it out of your house and you're going to be a new creature by the power of God today. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If one person in a house will make up their mind, this house is going to serve the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. God will begin to work in that house. Your children that are away from God. Your marriage that's a mess. If you'll let Jesus come in, Jesus can do like you heard me say. He created the whole world in six days. You think he needs 13 years to straighten you out? You're only one prayer away from the power of God reaching down from heaven. He picks them out of the pit, sets their feet on a rock to stay. It's not about whether God can do it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Where's Jesus when I'm going through all this? Knocking! If you keep me outside, I'll stay outside. He's not a demon. Demons force their way in. Jesus said, I stay and knock. If you'll quit going your own way, lay down your pride and open the door, I'll come in. I won't say, oh, you're going to open the door now. You think you can just open the door after 11 years? No! He didn't write that letter. He said, I correct and discipline everyone I love. I didn't preach this to make you feel bad. You have to talk loud to wake people up. You ever have your mom try to wake you up for school if you had like a gentleman? Wake up, bus is coming. You're going to miss the whole year. <laughs> your mom might have done that the first time, the second time, third time. Up! Get up! It's not because she hates you, because she doesn't want you to be 31 in fourth grade. <laughs> and I'm telling you, God's given gentle calls. But when he calls me in, it, the bus is coming. And so it's time to make up your mind to get rid of sin instead of sin getting rid of you. And listen, you, I mean, I could play videos all day. I don't care how bad your opium addiction is, opioid. Vicodin, Oxycontin, alcohol. I'm telling you, the power of God will break that sucker's neck off of your life and throw him out. You'll leave and say, man, I don't even have a desire for that anymore. Uncontrolled anger, sexual immorality. There is no sin that the blood of Jesus can't cleanse today. That's what Satan whispers when you have the door shut on Jesus. What's the point of opening the door? Because No! He's telling you not to open it because he knows if you do, he's done. And I believe the grace of God drove you here on this Mother's Day. Not just to show off a new dress. 
But for God to come in, for you to have the best run you've ever had in life, no matter what's gone wrong before today, from today till Jesus comes, you will make a mark on your family, on your children. Man, if there was ever a day where you can't raise children without the Holy Ghost, it's today. You don't need to just be a good parent that's read a few books on parenting. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. God will fill you today if you'll open the door. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Now listen very carefully. I'm going to invite those of you that need to open the door. How do you open the door? Jesus said, if you will confess me, Luke 12, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father that's in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father that's in heaven. When I was growing up, they gave these altar calls. Lift your hand where you are. No one looking around. I see that hand. God sees that hand. That's all that needs to see it. 30 years of camouflage altar calls has produced a generation of camouflage Christians. They're afraid to pray over their meal. They're afraid anyone's going to find out they're saved. But Jesus said, and we're going to do it the Jesus way. He didn't die for you in a private room. He hung naked on a cross publicly. And he said, if you want to be my follower, you must confess me before men. Come out from among them and be ye separate. So you have to make a decision. I don't care. I mean, it's almost like a precursor for what the rest of your life will be. I don't care what anybody in the crowd thinks. I care what God said and what God thinks. So today, I leave the crowd and I come forward to an altar. Remember, we talked about the second coming. The Bible says Jesus is coming back for his bride. Not a fiance, not a girlfriend. What's the difference between the three? If you asked all three women, they would say they love the guy. But only the bride has stood at an altar and made a public covenant that I am with this man till forever. So that's what you're doing when you come to the altar. You're not joining a religion. You're opening the door for the Son of God to come into your heart. And when he comes in, you will never be the same. Take it from this ex-speech impaired, ex-crooked footed little boy. When Jesus gets a hold of you, and he said in this last hour, Ten that originally had the fire, five would let the fire go out. And when he came back, they wouldn't be ready. So some of you are thinking, man, I, I just came to church today. Can I be saved? There's actually people here that have gone to church a long time. That if they were honest, you've let the fire go out. You don't pray anymore. You don't read the Bible anymore. You got caught up in Jacksonville. And you're going to miss heaven. But today, Jesus by his mercy is knocking at your, let me in, I'm not mad. I'm knocking because I love you. Let me in. If you're here today and you know the fire has gone out. Now think, I'll, get, I'll break it into two categories. Either you're here and, and think, there's never been a time where you publicly stood and made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Think of it. Can you not somebody sprinkled you? It's like when I went to the barber in Pittsburgh. My barber, I got him saved. He asked the new barber, hey man, where do you go to church? Or are, he said, are you saved? The guy said, no, I'm, I'm Lutheran, but I go to an Episcopal church. What does that mean? There's not Episcopal heaven. There's not Lutheran heaven. There's not Presbyterian heaven. There's just heaven. And since no man built heaven, nobody gets to rewrite the rules on what it takes to get in. That's why I'm telling you what the Bible says. If you confess me publicly, I will confess you publicly. I'm not asking you if you believe in God or if you're religious or spiritual. Has there ever been a time where you stood publicly and made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? If you've never done that, today's your day. Secondly, if you once did, and like the five foolish bridesmaids, something came, some attack, a death in the family, loss of a business, something happened, got you disconnected. And from that point forward, you realize now, I let the fire go up. And it actually wasn't Satan trying to kill my family member. He's trying to make it that we all go to hell. It wasn't just him trying to take my business. It was him trying to discourage me. So I said, oh, what's the point anymore? And the fire went out. Jesus said, I would that you be hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, lukewarm won't cut it. 
And in 2016, America, lukewarm, definitely won't cut it. The fire must never go out. If you're sleeping with somebody you're not married to, you're not saved. No sexually immoral person. No drunkard. Those that love wild parties. Let me tell you, as I told you before, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. So I want you to leave here today knowing. I know there's a lot of churches you could go to where they'll just, don't worry about it. I was at one church not long ago. They said, after you left, we had five couples that were living together ask if they could get married. They were all like in their 40s and 50s. I thought, what are you preaching the rest of the time? That they've come to your church for years and felt nothing about doing that. And then I preached for a couple nights. And like, oh, you better get married. So I don't want you to be able to look across at me on judgment day and say, you never saw it. You won't, can't blame me. It's like I can't remember what evangelist said. We can't stop people from going to hell. But they should at least have to jump over our bodies, kicking and screaming, telling them not to go. And that's what I, I give it my all. I don't want you to be lost. I want you to be saved. And then when you get saved, your children are going to enjoy a home where the presence of God lives. If you fall into either of those two groups, either you've never received Jesus Christ or you once did, but you're honest and say the fire went out, but I'm coming back today. All over this place, I want you to put your hand up high right now and wave it at me and we'll pray. God bless you. Yes. Us. Yes. Very quickly, everybody that lifted a hand, I want you to slip out of your seats. Those of you with more courage, come first. Your courage will help those that are more shy. But everyone, come to this altar today, and we're going to pray. We won't hold you long. Just pray. Come all the way as close as you can to the front to make room. Come, everyone that lifted a hand. Today's your day. God's going to relight your fire. God's going to deliver you from all oppressions of the devil. Hallelujah. Keep clapping. The hands that clap for souls will never grow old. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Man. Now, unless you have really strong abs, it's very difficult to lift both hands while you're on your knees. So if you only lift one, it's fine. But I want everybody that set this up, man, this is it right here. Hallelujah. The Bible says there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that comes home than 99 that remain righteous. So imagine, I, I can feel it in my spirit. And Jesus is coming soon. You think how many people would have missed it? And now you won't miss it ever. Say, I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Don't mumble it. I know in America, people only pray by mumbling. Say this out loud, clear, so God can hear you. I'm going to give you the words to say. This isn't like a, a recital. Some people have never prayed. So if I just said, okay, everybody ask Jesus into your heart, people won't even know what to say. So I'm giving you the words, but make them your own. Say it from the depth of your heart. God hears this prayer. You can be sure of that. He not only forgives your sin, he cleanses the sin. He erases the sin. He'll never remember anything you did before today. Say this out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I've come forward today to give you my life. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my mind. Make me new. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. 
I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords, and my Savior. Say this, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your power. Where I was weak, make me strong. In Jesus' name. Now say this so every devil in hell can hear you. Say, I am saved. I am a Christian. God is my Father. Heaven is my home. My sins are forgiven. And I will not turn back. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Lift your hand up to the Lord. That's the power of God. The Bible says, All the joys of him whose sins are forgiven, whose record of iniquity is blotted out, never to be remembered again. Greg Laurie in California says, God throws your sins in the sea of forgetfulness and posts a sign that says, No fishing allowed. So from now on, you don't come to God and say, Now, God, you know how much I've messed up. God doesn't remember anything that happened before now. So unless you, like, punch somebody on the way back to your seat or something, you're clear. Totally clear. You leave here as saved as I'm saved. It's not like God gives you, like, a 30-day trial period to see if you're really serious. From day one, you have access like I have access. So I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, everyone, that's the power of God touching you, too. Because you know, I'm not emotional. I know they say we get everybody worked up. and I'm not worked up. That's Jesus touching you right now. Reaching down on the inside where, the, where a surgeon's knife can't even go and picking things out that don't belong there anymore. These next 90 seconds, God's going to do what a counselor couldn't do in 15 years. God's going to do what three methadone clinics couldn't do. God will do right now in this prayer what man could never do in a lifetime. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every one of these men and women. I thank, that's it, that's the power of God. I thank you for touching them right now. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that's flowing into them, giving them power, strength, and desire to do what's right, to live for you in a world that doesn't live for you. I thank you, Father, that the same grace and power that brought them to church today and then brought them to this altar, that same grace and power will keep them on the road that leads to heaven, that they won't miss it one step to the left, one step to the right. They'll never go backwards. From this day forward, they begin to excel in their relationship with God. In Jesus' name, I curse every addiction in the sound of my voice. Everything you used to engage in that in the beginning was fun and then you realize, man, I'm not in control of this anymore. It's in control of me. I tell you in the name of Jesus, the hold of that thing is broken on your life now in the name of Jesus Christ. You're free. Every foul working of the devil that sought to put its clamps on you and drag you to hell I tell you, all those chains are broken. You're clean. You are a new creature. The old life is dead. Behold, all things become new. Receive that newness of life now in the name of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for it, Father, and I give you praise. Let not one of these be missing when the roll's called on judgment day. Let them all be standing on the right side with me and you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for it. I loose that power that comes from God. As you've opened the door, Jesus steps in right now. And when Jesus steps in, the Bible says, John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons and daughters of God. Everywhere you were weak, receive power. Power for your mind, power for your spirit, power for your body. Every sickness and disease, any blood disease that came in from using needles, from sleeping around, whatever, I command your blood to be clean now in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name. So just with your hand lifted or hands lifted, just with your own mouth, I want you to take 20 seconds and in your own way, just say thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for filling me with your power. Go ahead. Just there at the altar. Thank you. Just say thank you. If you ever want the anointing to increase, just thank God. 
and give him praise for all he's done. It's done. You don't need special prayer. Everything God has for you is yours now. Now you just walk in it. In Jesus' mighty name. In the name of Jesus. This young lady here in the gray and black dress, stand up and lift both hands to the Lord. Just lift both your hands there. The power of God's going to touch you right now. In Jesus' name. That's it. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. More, more, more. more. That's it. Stand through. That's it. More. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus Christ, all over this altar. Now listen, Sunday morning and Mother's Day in particular, obviously, people have plans, I understand. So that's why we have two services today. So tonight, 7, uh, seven o'clock tonight, 7 o'clock, we're going to do a miracle service. Where it'll be, just think of it like this, where we pick up from here. Now obviously, if you bring unsaved people, the Holy Spirit will draw them to the altar. But as you feel the Lord touching you right now, but you made an appointment. Some of you are already late for that appointment. I want to say congratulations for being here and honoring people getting saved. Your mother will understand. And if she guilt trips you, she was going to do it anyway. So, But tonight, when we come at 7, I want you to bring someone. And then I'm going to like that, what happened to that Muslim lady? And I'll, I'll play some more testimonies for you. If you know people that have cancer, you know people that are just in a place where no one can help them anymore. When it's impossible with man, God said, never with God. For with God, all things are possible. There is no mountain that can't be moved by faith. There's no irreversible situation with faith. Everything, everything is possible with God. And Mark 9, 23 said, all things are possible to him who believes. This is going to be the greatest week you've ever had. This Sunday night through Wednesday night, People won't even recognize you come Wednesday night. Get ready for God to do exceedingly, abundantly more than you ever thought possible all week long. Everybody that's here at the altar, just and those in your seats, just stay there. I want you to look up at me. I'm going to introduce your pastor to you, and he's going to give you some instruction. Normally, we'd say get plugged into church. Obviously, come next Sunday. But now, you have tonight through Wednesday. Don't miss them. And then you look how long the service went. If you can't make it till 8 because you get off work at 7, come. If you're a construction worker and you have sheetrock dust on you, no one cares. A baker and you have confectionery sugar, it's okay. But those should be the only two white powders that you come covered in. But I want to say to everybody that's at the altar, I love you so much and I, I really like, couldn't be more proud of you. You made the right call. And now, everything the devil would try to get you think, well, what are you going to do about this? What are you gonna? Don't worry. Just keep going forward, and God, you know, it's like this. When Peter was in prison, when the angel came to break him out, the Bible says when Peter walked with the angel, every door came open on its own. So everything the devil said, what are you going to do about that? Just keep walking forward, and the door will open up. You're never going to miss it. You're not going to go to hell. You're going to heaven, and you're going to live in victory all the days of your life. Amen. Everybody on this side, I love you. Let me introduce you to your pastor. Love you. See you tonight at 7. Wow. Come on, let's give it up. Look what the Lord has done this morning. I'll tell you, it's, it's only just begun. Five nights. We're going to continue to run for the Lord. Amen. I want to thank all of you for being so honest with the Lord and with yourself. It's, it's amazing. I love you guys so much. I want to take just a couple of minutes. We have some altar workers. All you guys raise your hand who are helping me and pastors. They're going to take a couple of moments, ask you a couple of questions. We just want to take the time to make record of this, see how we can pray and walk forward with you. And what's the next step for, for your journey that you've just begun? Amen. So be back tonight at 7 o'clock. Bring someone. How many of you know about 100 people that needed to hear that message today? We need it. It's an awakening. We need to wake up. Bring someone tonight. We'll see you at 7 o'clock and 7 o'clock every night until Wednesday. We love you very much. Bless you.
Mastodon goes. 